Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. So, um, I think our papers are going to go very well together. Uh, though they bring very different perspectives, it's uh, charming. Um, but I'm going to make a, a strong claim. I mean, I took the, uh, the pre-circulated introduction to the seminar extremely seriously. And uh, uh, I wanted to go after the um, things, the factors, the forces that would help, help us understand um, the upheavals that followed 1917 in a transnational way, in an international way that would allow us to widen the focus. And I'm actually going to talk, I've realized, about Asia as well as Europe and America. Um, but not just allow us to understand them as interconnected, um, but also, uh, and this has been a theme, I guess, in my comments over the last two days, to bring some kind of order to our understanding of the interrelationships, the scales, the magnitudes, and the relationships between the different moving parts in this drama. And if you're going to do that, and if that is your aim, and that's only one way one can approach this, but if that is your project, then it seems to me that there is one set of forces which I will claim, I think, is the most dominant in constituting this as some kind of totality. If the key point is the moment, as, uh, as our keynote speaker said, in which, as it were, all of the Pandora's boxes that have been opened begin to interact with each other, then one of the really driving forces of that melding together um, is the factor that I'm going to be focusing on, which is the process of inflation and deflation that issued from the war and followed after it. And to put that in more general terms, as I've said here, and to make explicit from the very start that what I'm about is not really just the story of macroeconomics, um, uh, what I want to stress is that this is que a question of order. Uh, so what we're talking about here and how best to think about this right from the very start, and it shouldn't be a difficult point for people in Germany to take in, because so much hangs for Germans on the question uh, of money and inflation, is that what we're talking about is the destabilization and restabilization of the global monetary order, one of the absolutely founding elements of any social entity or any polity. So this is not a question simply of macroeconomics. It's a question of one of the most basic media through which societies organize their collective relationship. To understand the full force of what I'm going to try and say, is you, the first thing you need to do is to shed the kind of Zondervig story about inflation that almost all of us, and particularly those of us brought up as historians of the Weimar Republic, have in our heads which is that the inflation and the hyperinflationary experience of World War I is basically a German experience. And what we have to do is to set that aside, because inflation, as I'll show you in just a second, was an absolutely generic side effect of war finance. No power in the war, whether victor or defeated, and across all of the shades of victory and defeat, was able to finance the war in a way which didn't produce inflation. Everyone financed it in part by borrowing, in part by taxing, and in part by effectively printing money. And the inevitable consequence of this was the ratio of money to goods changed, and the expression of that is a change in the price level. But the descent into hyperinflationary disintegration and chaos a la Weimar Republic is exceptional. Not entirely unique to Germany, Poland, Austria, Russia suffer this, um, but exceptional. And the most powerful countries, in fact, pursue in the wake of the war, in the wake of this inflationary experience, a hugely significant, historically significant policy, which is vastly underrated as a backdrop to the drama that we're trying to get to grips with, which is a story of deflation. So here are some numbers. And the points that I want you to take away from this, these are based on 100. And so any number over 100 shows inflation. And as you can see here, across this rather wide panel of countries across the world, there is no country which doesn't experience what, in our present day terms, would be considered really very alarming inflation. Um, China is the exception. And the beauty of this kind of macroeconomic approach is that China isn't just an exception. We can explain exactly why it is. It's because its currency is based on silver, and the price of silver in relation to gold changes. So China suffers a, real, or a much more modest inflation than anywhere else. But everywhere else, the winners as well as the losers <coughs> suffer at least a doubling in the uh, price of their goods over the course of the war. And then, of course, you can see the hyperinflation we break out Germany. I'll say more about that in a minute. But that just gives you a sense of how generic this is. Whether you're in the war, combatant or neutral, imperialized or not, you get sucked into this through the ramifications of the global monetary system, which map those of the telegraph system that Jan was pointing us to rather neatly. Uh, everyone is wired, and everyone is sucked up into this. <coughs> 
One could draw from this a kind of conclusion that, well, the weighted average, therefore, of experience during the war and its aftermath is that of a kind of moderate inflation followed by a moderate deflation. But that would be precisely the kind of generalisation that I think is not the way in which a widened history uh, should go. What we should be sensitive to is the way that within that widening and interconnection, order is shaped and reshaped. And what in fact happens after 1920 is that the world splits into three different groups whose status within the restored monetary system after World War I is fundamentally differentiated and different from each other with dramatic consequences for their standing in the world in the very material sense that it affects their creditworthiness. And as any, no, any person, any private individual knows, whether you're ranked in top credit, medium credit, or bad credit makes a gigantic difference to your, as Weber would put it, your life chances. In other words, it affects your life. And this is, broadly speaking, the way the world is structured. Deflators at the top, aggressive deflators, US and UK, I'll show you in a minute how aggressively they deflate. Stabilizers, these are countries which deflate to a certain degree, but not all the way back to the pre-war level relative to the US, which is doing the most deflating. That's France, Italy, Japan, and then the basket cases, the hyperinflators at the bottom. This is the world order that is shaped by this process. Now, what has this all got to do with the problem of revolution and counter-revolution? Well, again and again in the talks over the last couple of sessions, it's been there, but it has never, I don't think the word inflation has in fact ever been mentioned anywhere, but it's out of that pressure, I would argue, that, and now one has to use one's words carefully because we're treading here into the entire territory of the relationship between economic and cultural and political history that became the object of contestation in the 1980s. But let me, as a first approximation, and no more than that, say the raw material of social conflict or the basis of basic antagonisms and processes of identity uh, of formation or in terms that we just had, the stuff of those consumer conflicts and street-level conflicts. The shock, the indignation, aroused by the fact that you get to the front of the queue for the bread you've spent hours queuing for and it costs you more than you could possibly imagine bread could cost right now out of that come a variety of different sources of conflict um, it creates pressures for collective organization faced with this it pays to be part of a trade union very unlikely groups begin to join trade unions um, it pits those collectivities against each other because inflation is a zero-sum game Unlike deflations, where everyone would benefit from reflating, inflations are inherently zero-sum. And that then creates the basis for all sorts of other forms of radicalization. So I am not, and I don't want us to have an unproductive conversation in which I'm the person who suggested that the violence that we are analyzing in these complex ways result, was, reduces to this. Of course it doesn't. But this provides you with occasion after occasion, every shopping trip becomes the basis for the possibility of some kind of imaginative political mobilization. So it opens the door to that kind of activity. And once the scale and quality of radicalization reaches a certain point. And once collective organization reaches a certain point, you tip over into scenarios which one has, I think, to describe in kind of larger, grand tactical terms. What we get the possibility of is power being exercised in the way that syndicalists had always imagined it would be organized. In other words, if you can control the three sectors that matter to early 20th century economies, the railways, the mines, and the docks. And again and again in these stories of labor radicalization, this is why Hamburg matters, this is why the Ruhr matters, this is why Glasgow matters, this is what causes the Semana Tragica in Argentina is a combination of, a, I think, a tram workers strike and a dockyard strike. Once you get to see those kind of things forming, you begin to see the question of industrial conflict being translated quite directly into a question of macroscopic political power because a strike by those three groups of workers would paralyze society. So you go from conflicts over wages to questions of fundamental control, which are posed in society after society by the triple threat of the Triple Alliance. This is what Sorel talked about when he talked about a general strike. Um, this would be the translation of labor conflict into something truly revolutionary.
And it's out of that, then, I think, that we can begin to explain, and it's against that kind of backdrop that we then see the counter-reaction, which then can take on, of course, an entire logic of its own, uh, which can become precisely the kind of narrative-generating mechanism that can allow people to display their masculinity, that can allow societies to split into those who write newspaper articles and those the men of violence. Uh, and uh, it's remarkably generic. Um, and it's generic in the same way as inflation is generic in this period. So here, uh, Argentina. But the strike wave that we see in this period, wherever we have statistics, we see the same evidence of a huge surge in industrial conflict to unprecedented levels. When we forever after think about the capacity for industrial labor to exercise power, it's essentially this moment or the 1970s that we're referring to, perhaps in the US, the 1930s and 40s as well. But this is one of the great epic moments of class struggle uh, in European history, insofar as there ever has been that. And of course, the translation of a trade union conflict into a class uh, conflict is a complicated matter in its own right. It's all over the world. Here are the aftermath of the great rice riots in Japan. Probably, you know, if the Germans don't know about revolution, there's a good claim I think the Japanese don't know about revolution either. The closest the Japanese have ever got to violent street protest on an epic scale was probably the rice riots of the fall of 1918, though I may uh, be uh, criticized for that comment uh, later in Q&A. Um, but the scale of the upheaval in Japan as well uh, is, is enormous and causes great concern to Japanese conservatives, including Yamagata, who was quoted earlier on. Here, the data for the core, and this is the Biennio Rosso that you can see here, millions of Italian workers organized, broadly speaking, uh, in a struggle uh, to maintain their standard of living, though increasingly other issues, of course, swirled around this. <coughs> So the question is, what do you do about this? The question is, and this cartoon is fascinating, I think, because it describes this kind of practical problem of government. Capitalism and democracy was clearly always an uneasy kind of fix. Liberal political theorists had worried about this since the 19th century. Ever since chartism, people had speculated about how badly this can go. All of a sudden, the reality is facing the ruling classes of the world in the aftermath of World War I. One could say that this problem arises already before 1914. We could deal with that in Q&A. But certainly, from 1917 onwards, this is the question. This thing is going off. This alarm bell is going off. This is the nightmare scenario that they, you know, our mothers have warned us about. What the hell do we do to try and restore order? This is a kind of, think of this as a ticking bomb rather than just an alarm clock. Uh, it seems to me that the first line of options are price controls. If prices are going up, stop prices going up. Issue some administrative decree to insist that prices shouldn't go up. Or what you could do is, if prices are going up, somebody is responsible for them going up. Identify the profiteers who are driving prices up. And the third thing, of course, is if people are protesting against prices going up, then what you can try and do is you can knock down the people who are protesting. And those, broadly speaking, capture the repertoire of immediate responses to this crisis. And I think 1919 is where most countries try this three versions. Now, the problem with these um, is, and, and it, everyone does. So this is uh, uh, America, not a case that would feature within Robert's spectrum of, of the unhinged violent societies, a liberal society where something like monopoly of legitimate violence is maintained. And this is what it actually looks like in America in 1919. That's a so-called Cossack. Uh, here, co called Cossack because many of the workers in Pennsylvania were Polish, so when an arbitrary exercise of violence was directed against them, they tend to identify it with Russia, and they knew if they did identify it with Russia, it would delegitimate it in America. So this is a, a muckraking photograph uh, of an uh, American policeman assaulting an innocent worker. This could be a Freikorps photo from anywhere in Germany in 1919 or 1920. That's the US Army in Gary, Indiana, as you can see, festooned along the awnings of this building. And this, I think, goes rather nicely to this question of violence. Violence is what hurts. Well, spanking hurts. Uh, uh, does it really hurt? Uh, and that is the kind of question, I think, that liberal societies play through. Exactly how much is OK, and exactly how much fundamentally breaches the parameters of what kind of a society we think we are. But all of these solutions have problems. <coughs> Broadly speaking, um, uh, they kind of contradict themselves. They're at risk of undermining themselves. So market regulation is profoundly unpopular. Um, it creates an enormous mass of laws. 
Um, and it criminalizes large parts of totally innocent behavior. This is one of the classic learnings of World War I. It delegitimizes itself because middle class people who don't want to be lawbreakers end up breaking the law. Um, profiteering is just another word for businessman. And there's a terrible difficulty in distinguishing between legitimate and illegitimate profit. And for some, of course, that provides an opportunity to bring anti-Semitic tropes in. A whole variety of different things can swarm in here. But fundamentally, this is a difficult and dangerous policy to pursue. Profit regulation is not something that capitalist democracies, generally speaking, eagerly uh, seize and take up as an issue. And then finally, and this, I think, for me, goes to my unease with stories about stabilization, which fundamentally center on violence is it's not obvious how the pre-war world can really see massive, very public, very obvious displays of violence as stabilizing because fundamentally it's quite difficult to tell the difference and Italy plays this through in absolutely classic style in the 1920s, between the thug that you hired to suppress the revolutionary who's a useful servant of order and the public good and a revolutionary. And this is the question that the Nazis play through with the SA between 33 and 34, and it's what Mussolini plays through with the squad histories between 22 and 24. And at some point, generally speaking, you begin to back away from this as a strategy. And as, uh, as our previous speaker was saying, it can be associated with all sorts of visions of local order, autonomous freedom, not necessarily the kind of vision that you want to push towards. And fundamentally, there is a chorus of economists in the background telling you you're missing the point. If the pegs keep popping up and you keep having to bang them down, there's a reason. And the wider reason driving these conflicts which emerge all the time is not profiteering or inefficiency in retail or uh, just simply malevolence. It's ordinary people trying to protect their standard of living against rampant inflation. And you have to do something about inflation to stop this, um, to stop this, uh, to stop this crisis. That is the solution to getting the alarm clock to stop ringing. The problem is, uh, this is going to be painful. If you deflate, it's going to be painful. Quite how painful you can see from the country which leads this deflation, uh, which is the United States. So this is the curve of government spending in the United States and government revenue. And you can see an absolutely epic squeeze on the balance between spending and uh, revenue, uh, which is driving the inflation in the United States through the winter of 1919 and is suddenly put into reverse. And given our experience in the Eurozone recently, I don't need to fully flesh out for you what consequences this had for the entire public sector, the entire apparatus of the war time society that had been built in the United States as well since 1917. This is an epic political project uh, to deflate. You're going to have to raise taxes. You're going to have to reduce spending. You're going to have to raise interest rates to squeeze economic activity. Now, when is this decision taken? Um, it's taken in three places uh, with varying degrees of autonomy um, between the end of uh, 1919 and the spring of 1920. The place which exercises least autonomy where a kind of spontaneous deflation of the wartime boom happens is Japan, where commodity markets for silk and cotton collapse in the spring of 1920 and suck the Japanese economy down in a kind of spontaneous downturn. Um, but in Britain and the United States, it's a conscious political decision taken over that winter to gain a grip on the situation, to restore not the symptoms of order, but to restore the foundations of actual fiscal and monetary order by means of enormously politically expensive uh, deflation. And you can see the effects of this and its imprint on American macroeconomic history. Now, that graph shows you American prices from 1900 to 1939. That's the Great Depression. This is the deflation we remember. That's the de deflation after 1920. So a far bigger shock to the functioning of the American price system is delivered from the spring of 1920 than even that suffered under Herbert Hoover from 1929. So this is an epic realignment of the nominal values between wages and prices. This is the moment at which American agriculture goes into spasm. This is the moment in which the Ku Klux Klan rides again from 1920 as the great savior of the farmers whose livelihoods have been destroyed by deflation. This is France. You see the same break in France uh, as well. Um, this is Germany. Even the Weimar Republic, headed as we know towards hyperinflation, one of the absolute critical moments in the history of the Weimar Republic is 1920. The numbers are so big you can't see the significance of that, 
Um, but that's it there. It's a 25% deflation in the Weimar Republic in the first half of 1920 under the pressure of global markets driven by the British and the Americans downwards. Now, it's the consequences of that which the Weimar Republic flinches away from and heads back on its inflationary path. But the force of this shows up even there. This is it in the UK, a story like that of the US, not coincidentally because Britain's ambition is to track the dollar down um, to deflate as sharply. Here it's consequences, and this is what matters for our story fundamentally for unemployment. You see a huge surge in British unemployment. And again, it's the story, so it's the story of the interwar period, but with a difference. So here's the Great Depression, the 1930s Great Depression, the 1929 moment somebody was pointing us to yesterday. Here's the 1920 moment, and you can see the break in British labor market experience. The bad interwar period doesn't start in 1929, it starts in 1920, and it affects precisely the sectors which were suffering the most radical militancy in the aftermath of the war. So this is a staggering blow to the balance of class forces. It's not by incidence that, say, David Montgomery talks about the fall of the House of Labour in this moment. This is the moment where the labour movement in the liberal world suffers a, a setback from which it arguably never recovers in the 20th century, um, uh, never recovers from this. And it is absolutely generic across the whole world, and you can see the effect here in the strike numbers. So there's Britain and the US leading the strike league, and then you can see this collapse in strike activity in the UK in particular between 20 and 21. And in 21 in the spring, the breaking up of the Triple Alliance, crucially the Lloyd George government maneuvers the railway workers and the dockers and miners away from each other. And then really all that fear of Bolshevism uh, disappears. Was it deliberate? I'm pitching this here as a deliberate story. And in the context of the Eurozone debate where we have gone over the politicization of money over and over again, you know what's at stake in these kind of claims. My claim is certainly yes. As now, there is no question that monetary policy is seen by its protagonists as a political issue, fundamental political issue. Uh, it's easy to multiply the quotations from both liberals like Keynes, who said that if Lenin was serious about revolution, all he needed to do was debase the currency, through to conservatives like Yamagata, who says that all of the bad new ideas in Japanese society have come through the cost of living increase. So this is a concerted policy. It's a policy that's also understood at the time as comprehensive. So this is the first moment of macroeconomics. It's not Keynes of the general theory, it's Keynes as a junior monetary economist. It's already understood and graphed like this. These are contemporary data showing what's going on and relating it to the monetary money supply. So here's M0 and here's M3, narrow and broad money. And as these track down, what the economists are telling you, the prices go down too, right? So it's a concertedly understood macroeconomic adjustment with political effects of the first order. Do they understand how serious it's going to be that it's going to cause mass bankruptcy too? No. Do they understand how America's crash landing of its economy will drive everyone down? No. They don't understand the full articulation of this policy, but they do grasp um, its interconnectedness. And uh, it's capped by an institutional move, which is the restoration of the gold standard globally from 1924 <coughs> onwards. In fact, the Soviet Union is the first to return to gold during the NEP phase um, in 21-22, closely followed by the Germans, and then this list of countries. So not only is it understood as concerted, not only is there a theory of it, but there's an institutional practice. And the contemporary commentator who grasps this most clearly is Karl Polanyi, um, in his magnificent retrospective account, The Great Transformation, and he describes this, and we might argue about this, but he describes this concerted monetary policy deflation of the early 1920s as the most comprehensive policy effort in history. Full stop. There had never before been a concerted policy move like this across the entire world in this, with this degree. Now, obviously, Versailles is building up to it. The League of Nations is providing a forum for global action in various ways. This may be the first, if you like, executive branch action coordinated across much of the world at a single moment. And it is aimed at this objective of monetary stabilization with a clear understanding that this will be the foundation of a restored conservative order in the aftermath of the war. Now, who does it contain? And this is my final point. Obviously, its primary aim, and this is our knee-jerk, our immediate understanding, 
And it's what's pointed to by that odd phrase that I put in the title, which if you're not a native speaker of English may strike you as odd. What's a knave? A knave is a, is a miscreant, uh, a lummel, um, uh, a, 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 a misbehaved, unreliable character. Um, the gold standard is described by Montague Norman, uh, the Chancellor of the Bank, the Governor of the Bank of England, as knave-proof. So what that will do is to contain, in ways that we fully understand, the OYO turns out to be pretty knave-proof too, so we don't really need to explain this. It'll exclude Varifakis-type characters in a fairly consistent way. And we can see this again and again in this period. It breaks the SPD out of government finally in 23-24. It is the famous Mur d'Argent, which faced the Cartel de Gauche in France in 1924, the first effort to put together a left-leaning coalition in France after the war. And it breaks the Labour Party um, in 1929-31 during the Great Depression. And it, of course, triggers the return to gold, triggers the general strike, the great showdown, which sends shockwaves through the world and panics uh, Stalin. Stalin believes that the breaking of the British trade unions, the assertion of autocratic leadership in Poland, and then the great defeat in China are, are part of a global uh, anti-revolutionary strategy orchestrated by London. Uh, and the general strike is a direct result of Britain's return to gold, rendering the mining sector uncompetitive, provoking the last great upsurge of trade union protest and its defeat. So this is one part of the story unambiguously. But you don't understand the way in which even liberals and indeed social democrats adhere to the gold standard. And this is one of the fantastic puzzles that people like Hilferding and Snowden and the entire spectrum of liberal opinion, particularly in countries like Japan and Italy, adheres to the gold standard because there are two types of knaves that it controls. And the other type of knaves that it controls are on the right. Because where had the destabilization in monetary terms come from? It had been the war. And whose war had it been? It hadn't primarily been the war of the Social Democrats and the Liberals. It had been the war of the imperialists. So this is, as you like, the monetary flip side to the liberal Wilsonian critique of imperialism, is that a restored gold standard will limit the conditions for revanchist militarism in the aftermath. It will substitute for the non-existent uh, political and diplomatic order that has been failed to, pro uh, failed to be produced. It is as integral to the order of peace as the euro is claimed to be to the order of peace that is the EU today. It, the, the crisis has resulted from the war on war expenditure. It was nationalism that was at least as much a threat to liberalism after World War I as, uh, as socialism was. Nationalism and socialism together hadn't really happened yet. We'll get there in the 1930s. And the force of monetary and fiscal stabilization could be operated on both sides of the political spectrum because it limits and backs up the politics of arms control, which is the second wave of American stabilization efforts after the demise of the ill-fated Democratic administration and the rise of the Republicans. And the great arena for this is November 1921, the Washington Conference. Now, the Washington Conference is spectacular in two respects. It's an effort to broker a deal between China and Japan, and it's an effort to limit the strategic weapons that underpinned the blockade that was the foundation of liberal power, liberal coercion, and indeed targeted violence against civilians um, in World War I. And the aim of the game was to control arms control. So this is as significant as nuclear arms control in the Cold War uh, period. And crucially, at Washington, what is directly tied together is economy and peace. So the cartoon here captures it as brilliantly as anything can. Here are the Japanese and here are the French coming in the background with their, sorry, these are the French and the Italians with their naval ambitions in the background. And presiding over it, you have a coalition, maybe that's in fact the Chinese, the Americans and the British, presiding over the humbling of the French and the Japanese in their imperialist ambition in which their weapons are brought to the scrap heap, economy is restored, and with economy goes peace. The thing which is very difficult for us to get our heads around, as, for instance, Schäuble's politics are hard for us to get around today, is how an internationalist in economics and diplomacy can be a conservative, austere in financial policy. But it's precisely that combination that we see rehearsed for the first time in the 1920s. It's a powerfully pressurized uh, stabilization policy that acts on both sides. And its effects are real. This is battleship construction um, 
over this period. A huge surge before 1914, and then a complete gap till the breakdown of this order in the 1930s. Has hugely real effects on the net balance of naval power in the arms race up to World War II, and dramatically reduces the arms budgets of all of the countries. The two countries where you can see this operating most directly, and where we have fantastic studies which show this symmetrical op operation, one on Italy and one on Japan, I would strongly recommend to you. Metzler on Japan is simply brilliant. Mignon's classic book on Italy shows exactly the same effect, where Mussolini, having seized power and suppressed the squadristi, um, allows himself and his country to be locked within the uh, structures of the gold standard. So my conclusion is this, that if we're talking about strategies of counter-revolution, then the hegemonic liberal strategy of counter-revolution is not that of the micropolitics of violence or the unhinging uh, and the unleashing of um, uh, paramilitary violence, or simply the reassertion of the monopoly of violence on the part of the state. It is this policy of monetary and financial stabilization, which has spectacularly desirable qualities from the point of view of this kind of strategy of counter-revolution. It's indirect. It's not a question of face-to-face. -face. It's a question of changing the parameters for everyone's action. It avoids obvious repressive violence which is, can be as destabilizing as it's stabilizing. It's always capable, as Sorel told us, of various types of mythical overload, which we as liberals would far rather avoid. It is backed up by a ramified ideology of virtue, of modesty, of good housekeeping. In Japan, it's sold as a feminine issue to women as a clean, clean foundation because the state will now keep house in the same way as they keep their budgets. It's a classic hegemonic ideology. It's infrastructural. It sits within the structures of society and is permanent. Um, so you don't need to worry all the time about knocking the pegs down because they simply don't pop up. That is the beauty of it. It's transnational in the full sense. It operates not just state to state, though it does, but on business communities within states, which acquire massive vested interests in the upholding of this order because of financial entanglements that it enables. You can borrow in Wall Street if you're a Japanese or an Italian or a German uh, company. And finally, and the beauty of it is that it operates symmetrically on the two great threats uh, to liberal hegemony that emerged from World War I, which is both the left and the right. Thank you very much. <laughs>